they said, this blood is alive. And then they said, whose blood is this? Archaeologists have just discovered what they believe to be the blood of Jesus Christ. And the news is far from comforting. After years of speculation and controversy, this groundbreaking find is sending shockwaves through both scientific and religious communities. But what exactly did they uncover? And why is it so alarming? Join us as we enter into this incredible story and uncover the chilling implications of this discovery that could change everything we thought we knew. In an astonishing twist of fate, a man named Ron Wyatt embarked on a journey that would intertwine his life with some of the most intense mysteries of biblical history. Originally a nurse anesthetist, Wyatt's career took a dramatic turn when he transitioned into the world of archaeology. But who exactly was Ron Wyatt and what led him to make such extraordinary claims? Ron Wyatt was born in 1933 in Tennessee and worked as a nurse anesthetist for much of his life. Despite his medical background, Wyatt had a closer fascination with biblical history, which eventually led him to pursue amateur archaeology. His passion was ignited by a desire to uncover the physical evidence of biblical events. This curiosity pushed him to explore ancient sites that many believed held secrets from the past. One of Wyatt's first major claims was the discovery of Noah's Ark. In the late 1970s, he announced that he had found the remains of the Ark on Mount Ararat in Turkey. This claim was met with significant skepticism from the scientific community as it lacked substantial evidence and peer-reviewed research. Yet, Wyatt's assertions did not end there. He went on to claim the discovery of the true location of Mount Sinai, the site of the Israelites' crossing of the Red Sea, and even the remains of Sodom and Gomorrah. Each of these discoveries stirred controversy and debate, as many archaeologists and historians questioned the validity of his findings. Despite the criticism, Wyatt's work captured the imagination of many believers who saw his discoveries as a validation of their faith. It was Wyatt's claim about finding the blood of Jesus Christ that truly propelled him into the spotlight. According to Wyatt, during an excavation beneath the site of the crucifixion at Golgotha, he discovered the Ark of the Covenant. This alone would have been a monumental find, but what he claimed next was even more astonishing. Wyatt stated that he found a dark, dried substance on the mercy seat of the Ark, which he believed to be the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood, he asserted, had trickled down through a crack in the rock caused by the earthquake at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. This discovery, if true, would have intense implications for both religious believers and the scientific community. The process of analyzing this blood was just as intriguing. Wyatt took the sample to a laboratory in Israel, where it underwent various tests. The lab technicians reconstituted the blood and discovered something extraordinary. It had only 24 chromosomes, unlike the typical 46 found in human blood. This unusual chromosomal count suggested a divine origin, fueling further debate and fascination. But why has this discovery remained so contentious? What are the implications of finding such a significant artifact, and why has it sparked such intense debate? As we move more into Wyatt's findings and the reactions they provoked, we will uncover the layers of controversy and the terrible news that comes with it. The site of this groundbreaking discovery is none other than Golgotha, also known as the Place of the Skull. This historic location, situated just outside the old city walls of Jerusalem, is traditionally believed to be the site of Jesus Christ's crucifixion. Nearby is the Garden Tomb, another significant biblical site which has long been a focal point for Christian pilgrims. It was Jeremiah's Grotto, a lesser-known location in the northern region of Jerusalem that played a crucial role in this discovery. Controversial archaeologist Ron Wyatt 
said he was led by the Holy Spirit to excavate here. During an excavation in the early 1980s, Wyatt claims to have discovered a system of underground tunnels and caverns. He made his incredible discovery in these secret passageways. Wyatt recounted discovering the Ark of the Covenant, the hallowed treasure that contained the Ten Commandments according to the Bible. But the discovery didn't stop there. Wyatt noticed a dark substance on the mercy seat of the Ark which he believed to be dried blood. He followed a crack in the rock above the site and proposed that this blood had trickled down from the site of the crucifixion. Wyatt was convinced that this was the blood of Jesus Christ, shed during his crucifixion and preserved for nearly two millennia. This claim sent shockwaves through both the religious and archaeological communities. The process of confirming the discovery involved several steps. Wyatt took the blood sample to a laboratory in Israel, where it underwent extensive testing. The results were nothing short of miraculous. The blood was found to have only 24 chromosomes, 23 from the mother, and a single Y chromosome. This was unlike any other human blood, which typically has 46 chromosomes, suggesting a divine origin. The initial reactions to Wyatt's discovery were a mix of awe and skepticism. Many in the religious community were quick to embrace the find as a divine confirmation of their faith. For them, this discovery was the ultimate proof of the biblical narrative. The scientific and archaeological communities were not as easily convinced. The lack of peer-reviewed documentation and independent verification led many experts to question the validity of Wyatt's claims. Critics pointed out several inconsistencies and gaps in Wyatt's story. For instance, there were no detailed records of the excavation, and the precise location of the laboratory that conducted the tests was never disclosed. Furthermore, Wyatt's refusal to allow independent experts to examine the blood sample only fueled the skepticism. Despite the controversy, the discovery continues to captivate the imagination of believers and skeptics alike. Could this really be the blood of Jesus Christ, and what are the implications if it is? The questions surrounding this find are as intense as they are numerous. Once reconstituted, the blood underwent a series of tests to determine its composition and origin. The first shock came when the lab confirmed that the sample was indeed human blood. This was expected, but what came next was astonishing. The technicians proceeded to extract white blood cells and place them in a growth medium, keeping them at body temperature for another 48 hours. This step was highly unconventional, as dried blood is typically considered dead and incapable of cellular growth. When the time came to examine the blood under a microscope, the results defied all expectations. The lab technicians discovered that the white blood cells were viable, but also actively dividing. This led to the stunning claim that the blood was still alive. But what does alive mean in this context? Essentially, it suggested that the blood's cellular structures were intact enough to function as they would in a living organism, a finding that challenged conventional scientific understanding. Jerusalem, a city steeped in history and tradition, holds a special place in the hearts of billions worldwide. Its ancient streets are home to some of the most significant religious sites in Christianity. These sites, including the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Garden Tomb, and Bethlehem's Church of the Nativity, are important for their historical value, but also for their intense spiritual significance. These locations are believed to be touchstones of Jesus Christ's life, from his birth to his crucifixion and resurrection. One of the lesser known yet intensely significant sites is the Monastery of the Flagellation. This monastery is traditionally believed to be the place where Jesus was scourged by Roman soldiers and crowned with thorns. Located in the heart of Jerusalem, the monastery serves as both a place of worship and an archaeological hub. The chocolate-brown habit of the Franciscan friars and the ancient relics within its walls 
tells stories of faith and history intertwined. Father Eugenio Aliata, a Franciscan friar and professor of Christian archaeology, is a key figure at the Monastery of the Flagellation. His office is filled with excavation reports, measuring reels, and other tools of the trade embodying the fusion of faith and science. Father Aliata has dedicated his life to protecting and excavating ancient religious sites in the Holy Land. His perspective offers a unique blend of devout faith and rigorous scientific inquiry. Tradition gives more life to archaeology, and archaeology gives more life to tradition, Father Aliata says, showing the symbiotic relationship between the two. In the Holy Land, where tradition is severely rooted in the soil, archaeology often follows the paths laid out by centuries of belief and devotion. This approach respects the spiritual significance of these sites, but also enriches the historical narrative with tangible evidence. For example, the Pool of Bethesda, where Jesus is said to have healed a paralyzed man, was long considered a myth by many scholars. It wasn't until archaeologists discovered the remains of this ancient pool beneath layers of history that the biblical account was given archaeological credence. This discovery exemplifies how tradition and archaeology can validate each other, revealing closer truths about the past. Father Aliata's work often leads him to explore these layers of history. He acknowledges that finding direct archaeological evidence of Jesus Christ is rare and challenging. He argues that dismissing the historical trace of Jesus based on the absence of evidence is flawed. You can't say Jesus doesn't have a trace in history, he asserts, emphasizing that even without concrete artifacts, the impact of Jesus' life is undeniable. The role of tradition in guiding archaeological work cannot be overstated. Sites like the Garden Tomb and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre are revered for their historical claims, but for their ongoing spiritual significance to millions of pilgrims. These locations are living statements to the enduring power of faith and tradition. For many reasons, including this miracle, tourists flock to Jerusalem and Bethlehem from all over the world. These holy towns are historical sites and living embodiments of religion. Every year, thousands of people travel to Bethlehem, especially during the Christmas season, because it is widely thought to be the birthplace of Jesus. Many visitors travel to the Church of the Nativity, which has a silver star marking the site of Jesus' birth, in order to walk on sacred ground and have a highly spiritual experience. Similarly, Jerusalem holds a special place in the hearts of believers. Sites like the Via Dolorosa, the path believed to be walked by Jesus on his way to the crucifixion, and the Mount of Olives, where he prayed before his arrest, draw pilgrims seeking to walk in the footsteps of Christ. These pilgrimages are about visiting historical sites. They are spiritual journeys that renew and strengthen the faith of those who undertake them. The diversity of modern Christian practices is as vibrant as the faith itself. From the solemn processions of Catholic devotees in Spain to the exuberant gospel choirs of African-American churches in the United States, Christianity manifests in myriad forms. In Indonesia, for example, Christians rise from their baptism in the Jordan River wearing gowns depicting Jesus undergoing the same rite. This global tapestry of worship emphasizes how the faith that began as a small Jewish sect has grown into the world's largest and most diverse religion with over two billion adherents. Yet despite this diversity, the core of Christian faith remains the same. The belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, His death and resurrection forms the foundation that unites all Christians. This shared belief is what drives millions to embark on pilgrimages, seeking a closer connection with the divine. Pilgrimages to the Holy Land offer a unique opportunity to experience the biblical narratives firsthand. 
walking through the ancient streets of Jerusalem, visiting the Sea of Galilee where Jesus performed miracles, and standing in the Garden of Gethsemane where he prayed, pilgrims find themselves immersed in the sacred history of their faith. These journeys often evoke intense emotional and spiritual responses, reinforcing the timeless relevance of the Christian story. But what makes these pilgrimages truly special is the sense of community they foster. People from different cultures and backgrounds come together, united by their faith. This unity is palpable during events like the Holy Fire Ceremony, where thousands of candles are lit from a single flame, symbolizing the light of Christ spreading across the world. It's a powerful reminder that despite the differences in practices and traditions, the essence of the faith remains universal. As we continue to see the modern expressions of ancient faith, it becomes clear that these practices are more than just rituals. They are intense declarations of belief, connecting the past with the present and believers with the divine. What other traditions and practices continue to inspire faith in today's world? How do these pilgrimages shape the lives of those who undertake them? Jesus of Nazareth, the figure at the heart of Christianity, spent his early years in the small village of Nazareth, situated in the rolling hills of Galilee. Archaeological excavations in Nazareth have revealed a modest agricultural community, typical of the first century. The findings include simple stone houses, agricultural terraces and ancient cisterns, painting a picture of a humble village life. These discoveries provide a backdrop for understanding the early environment that shaped Jesus. Just three miles from Nazareth lies Sepphoris, a bustling city that served as the Roman provincial capital of Galilee during Jesus' youth. Unlike the rural simplicity of Nazareth, Sepphoris was a hub of Greco-Roman culture, featuring grand buildings, theatres and intricate mosaics. Archaeologists have unearthed extensive ruins, including a Roman villa adorned with the famous Mona Lisa of Galilee mosaic. This proximity to Sephorus suggests that Jesus and his family were likely influenced by the broader cultural and economic activities of this significant urban center. The cultural and political landscape of Galilee during Jesus' time was complex and dynamic. Galilee was under Roman occupation, which imposed heavy taxes and strict controls on the local population. This environment of oppression and social unrest would have sincerely affected the communities living there. The Roman influence was evident in the infrastructure and administrative systems, but also in the cultural exchanges that occurred through trade and interaction. This setting provides crucial context for understanding Jesus' teachings and actions. Some scholars, like John Dominic Crossan, suggest that Jesus was a religious figure, but also a social revolutionary. Crossan, a prominent historian and theologian, argues that Jesus' message was inherently subversive, challenging the socio-political norms of his time. According to Crossan, Jesus advocated for a radical reordering of society based on principles of justice and compassion, directly opposing the oppressive Roman regime and the collaborating Jewish elite. Crossan's theories are supported by archaeological and textual evidence indicating that Jesus' message resonated with the marginalized and oppressed. His teachings emphasized the importance of caring for the poor and challenging the status quo, which aligns with the socio-economic conditions of Galilean society. The parables and actions of Jesus, such as dining with tax collectors and healing the sick, can be seen as acts of defiance against the established social order. The interplay between Galilean culture and Roman influence is further illustrated by the discovery of ritual baths and Jewish stone vessels in Sephoris. These findings indicate a strong Jewish presence maintaining religious practices despite the pervasive Greco-Roman culture. This duality of cultural influences would have shaped Jesus' worldview, merging Jewish traditions with a critique of Roman imperialism. 
As we piece together the archaeological findings from Nazareth and Sephorus, a more nuanced picture of Jesus' early life emerges. He was a product of a rural Jewish village, yet he was also exposed to the cosmopolitan environment of Sephorus. This blend of influences likely contributed to the development of his revolutionary teachings and his ability to connect with diverse audiences. In the quest to uncover the historical Jesus, several significant archaeological discoveries have provided valuable insights and sparked intense interest. Among these are the findings in Capernaum, the discovery of the Jesus boat, and the ossuary of Caiaphas. Each of these discoveries sheds light on different aspects of Jesus' life and the world in which he lived. Capernaum, often referred to as the Town of Jesus, was a small fishing village on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee. It played a crucial role in Jesus' ministry and is mentioned frequently in the New Conclusion. Archaeological excavations in Capernaum have revealed a well-preserved first-century synagogue and numerous residential structures offering a glimpse into the daily life of its inhabitants. One of the most significant finds in Capernaum is the discovery of what is believed to be Peter's house. This humble dwelling, identified through extensive archaeological research, was transformed into a place of Christian worship by the second century. The house's stone walls were plastered over and household items were replaced with oil lamps, indicative of a gathering place for early Christians. In the fourth century, a church was built over the site, further solidifying its significance. The fact that Peter's house has been located is significant because it offers a concrete link to one of Jesus' closest disciples. This exact house became a major point of Jesus' ministry when the Gospels relate how he healed Peter's mother-in-law there. The early Christians' respect for the location and their determination to maintain its holiness are demonstrated by the conversion of the dwelling into a house of worship. In 1986, a severe drought in Israel led to the remarkable discovery of the Jesus boat along the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Two brothers from a nearby kibbutz stumbled upon the remains of an ancient boat while searching for artifacts in the exposed lake bed. Archaeologists quickly recognized the significance of the find and undertook an emergency excavation to preserve the fragile vessel. Carbon-14 dating confirmed that the boat dated back to the first century, the time of Jesus. Measuring about 27 feet long and 7.5 feet wide, the boat could accommodate about 15 people, making it similar to the fishing boats mentioned in the Gospels. The discovery provided a rare and tangible link to the daily life of fishermen in Galilee, including Jesus' disciples, many of whom were fishermen by trade. The Jesus boat is significant for its historical value, but also for its symbolic connection to Jesus and his disciples. The Gospels describe several instances where Jesus taught from a boat, calmed a storm, and performed the miracle of the great catch of fish. The boat serves as a powerful reminder of these events and the setting in which they took place. Another groundbreaking discovery is the ossuary of Caiaphas, a limestone bone box unearthed in a Jerusalem tomb in 1990. The ossuary is inscribed with the name Joseph's son of Caiaphas, identifying it as belonging to the high priest who played a significant role in the trial and crucifixion of Jesus. According to the Gospels, Caiaphas was the high priest who conspired to arrest Jesus and handed him over to the Roman authorities. Caiaphas Oshery's discovery is noteworthy for a number of reasons. First of all, it bridges the gap between historical truth and biblical narrative by offering first-hand archaeological evidence of a significant character named in the first chapter of the Bible. It provides information about the socio-political climate and customs surrounding burial in first-century Jerusalem. The ornately decorated ossuary reflects the high status of Caiaphas and his family, 
it serves as a poignant reminder of the historical context in which Jesus lived and the powerful figures who shaped the events leading to his crucifixion. As we explore these significant archaeological finds, we gain a higher understanding of the historical Jesus and the world he inhabited. Each discovery adds a layer of context and authenticity to the biblical narrative, inviting us to reflect on the intense impact of these ancient artifacts. Biblical archaeology, while fascinating and revealing, is fraught with challenges and controversies. Balancing faith and science is a delicate act, one that demands rigorous scrutiny and respect for both belief and empirical evidence. The field of biblical archaeology often finds itself at the intersection of faith and science. Archaeologists like Father Eugenio Aliata, who are also men of faith, navigate this terrain with a unique perspective. They strive to uncover historical truths while respecting the spiritual significance of the sites they excavate. This balance is not always easy to maintain. Scientific methods demand hard evidence and repeatable results, while faith often relies on belief without proof. This dichotomy can lead to tension, especially when archaeological findings challenge long-held religious beliefs. For instance, the discovery of the Pool of Bethesda validated a biblical account once thought to be myth. Such findings can strengthen faith by providing tangible evidence of biblical narratives. Conversely, the absence of evidence for certain events or locations described in the Bible can sow doubt and fuel skepticism. This ongoing balancing act underscores the complexities faced by those who tread the line between faith and scientific inquiry. The influence of politics and religion on biblical archaeology is intense and often controversial. Many significant archaeological sites are located in politically sensitive regions, such as Jerusalem. The control and interpretation of these sites can become a battleground for political and religious ideologies. Governments and religious groups may fund or obstruct excavations based on how findings align with their agendas. Ron Wyatt, for instance, generated both excitement and skepticism when he claimed to have found the Ark of the Covenant and the blood of Jesus. Some thought his research was hidden because it might lead to disputes between different religious groups. Political factors can influence archaeological study, as demonstrated by the purported intervention of the Israeli authorities. Religious influence can also shape archaeological endeavors. Sites like the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Garden Tomb are maintained and interpreted by religious organizations. These groups have vested interests in promoting certain narratives that affirm their faith traditions. While this can lead to valuable preservation efforts, it can also result in biased interpretations of archaeological evidence. The interplay between skepticism and faith is a central theme in biblical archaeology. Discoveries like the ossuary of Caiaphas or the Jesus boat can bolster faith by providing physical connections to biblical figures and events. These finds are often met with skepticism from the scientific community, which demands rigorous verification and peer-reviewed research. Skeptics argue that some archaeological claims are driven more by a desire to validate religious texts than by objective scientific inquiry. They caution against accepting findings at face value without thorough investigation. This skepticism is essential in ensuring the credibility and integrity of archaeological research. On the other hand, faith communities may view these discoveries as affirmations of their beliefs, regardless of scientific scrutiny. The belief in the divine and the miraculous often transcends the need for empirical proof. For believers, the spiritual significance of these findings can be more important than their scientific validation. This tension between skepticism and faith can lead to polarized views on archaeological discoveries. While some, 
celebrate these findings as confirmations of their faith, others remain cautious, awaiting more definitive evidence. This dynamic reflects the broader relationship between science and religion, where each can inform and challenge the other. These are difficult questions to answer, and we must approach them critically and with an open mind as we continue to look more into the field of biblical archaeology. What further findings might be made, and how would they affect our perceptions of faith and history? The journey through the challenges and controversies in biblical archaeology is far from over. Join us as we uncover more stories that illuminate the complex relationship between faith, science, and history, shedding light on the enduring quest to understand our shared past.